pleasure to have uh, Ronnie Kosloff here um, in Cambridge. Uh, some of you know and some of you have attended this workshop which just concluded at ICAMP on uh, colloquially the quantum uh, thermodynamics. Um, and, uh, and what uh, Ronnie is going to do is going to summarize for us what this workshop was about and, and describe uh, these sort of quantum devices uh, which uh, obey thermo laws of thermodynamics. Um, to give you an idea of what uh, he's done, he was a postdoc at Chicago with Stuart Rice before joining the faculty at Hebrew University in 1981, where he has been ever since. Um, he's an expert on, on, on a variety of topics, including molecular dynamics uh, in, in chemical systems. And uh, some of the original ideas for doing uh, this pump probe uh, spectroscopy in, for coherent control of chemical processes, which is now a workhorse in, in, in chemical physics, were developed with uh, um, Stuart Rice and, and then I think Ronnie was in, in Chicago. Um, and also at the same time he developed uh, these sort of time-dependent numerical techniques which I think actually bear some of his, uh, his name on it. But it, related to the talk today, um, I don't know how many of you know, that in 1984 he published a paper um, in Journal of Chemical Physics called the Quantum Mechanical Open Systems as a Model of Heat Engine. And that may have been one of the earliest work on what we now sort of consider quantum thermodynamics. But I think today he was going to uh, mostly concentrate on the reverse part of it, maybe on the refrigerators, quantum refrigerators. So with that, I'll yield the floor to Ronnie. And uh, please. Okay, so <clears throat> really nice to be here. And uh, so I. First, I'll apologize. I won't be able to summarize the workshop. There's a lot of things that we learned. It was a very exciting workshop that uh, I'll try to kind of follow a few ideas about what is quantum thermodynamics, why we're here, and what's new about that. I would say what's old and what's uh, new in the subject. So, before I go on, these are, this is a team of people I, work, I worked with. Some are in the audience here. Thomas Dean is here. Robert Dalitsky is here. And others are and graduate students. M much of the work was done by Amika Levy, which I'll talk about. Ethan Geber was my first uh, graduate student on this subject. So as you see, not too many people that spread on about 30 years uh, of work maybe even, even more than that, so. And so, okay, so let's uh, see where we start. And we start with the idea, I would say, of consistency. And so what we do now is we start from quantum mechanics and we see how thermodynamics emerges from quantum mechanics. And then we can ask, these are modern questions, can thermodynamic viewpoint be relevant to a single device at the quantum level? So how small can we be? And this is another question, how, what's the limit of miniaturization of a quantum heat engine? And eventually, we'll reach to the question, what is really quantum about the quantum heat engine? You'll see there's a kind of provo provocative question about here. And the following, which I think is just emerging question, is there a quantum supremacy? So this is kind of the outline what I want to talk about, but that's where I, I'm going to start at this 1905 paper of Einstein, which in a way didn't reverse. This, I would say, this paper is the foundation of quantum mechanics as we know it, and Einstein starts from thermodynamics. So this is an English translation for the German version of that, and usually when we teach our students, we take this that the energy is proportional to the frequency, but if you look through the reasoning, here I, you can look what's written here. This equation shows that the entropy of monochromatic radiation of sufficiently low density varies with the volume according to the same law as the entropy of an ideal gas 
or that of a dilute solution. So, how does Einstein uh, look at this? He looks at the, this is his conclusion, that monochromatic radiation of low density within the range of validity of Wine's radiation formula behaves thermodynamically as if it consists of mutually dependent energy quanta of magnitude. So, what Einstein does there, he does analogy between an ideal gas, as we know, particle light, and behavior, thermodynamic behavior, or statistical mechanics behavior of light inside a cavity, and goes to the radical conclusion that light is quantized, just from that. And <clears throat> so, sometimes people refer to this paper as a photoelectric effect, but that's wrong because a photoelectric effect here was measured by Millick in 1914, you could say nine years after this paper came out. So, uh, that, that you could say the reasoning, which I'm going to use also, is a reasoning of consistency. And the way Einstein taught us that <coughs> any theory should be consistent with thermodynamics, and he uses this reasoning to look at the uh, distribution of light in a cavity and reach to the conclusion that light is, is quantized. So now what we do, we kind of go in the opposite way. We start usually from quantum mechanics, which is, for at least most of us is a <coughs> much more established uh, theory and try to go the opposite way and derive or at least look uh, the analogies of the laws of thermodynamics starting within the you could say the foundations of quantum mechanics. So this is the, you could say the, the modern version of uh, quantum thermodynamics. So you could say it's a, on one hand it's a very old theory, on the other hand it's emerging as something. So let's start to, I would say, the fundamental, very important example that <coughs> is in this paper of Scoville and Schulz de Bois on PRL number 2, 1959. And here we see the picture of Scoville. And he was one of the developers of solid state lasers. So he wasn't, you can say, he was in Bell Labs, he wasn't anybody who was uh, mainstream uh, physics. And what does he say? Here's a three level laser. Let's look how it works. I have two levels here connected to the hot bath. These two levels are connected to the cold bath. And I have Boltzmann statistics between these two bells, so let's say NH is what I have here, and you, if I look at the energy levels here, NC is what I have here, this Boltzmann factor, and what we know that if this is going to work as an amplifier, we need gain or positive gain, we need population inversion between these two levels, so this is a condition that we need for this to work as an amplifier, and if we think about the efficiency of this device, what we invest, we invest this frequency here. What we get out is a radiation frequency which is lower. So this would be the efficiency of this device. We can write it like that. And now, if we just stick these Boltzmann relations into here, there are monotonic functions. Therefore, we can reach this inequality, which gives us a relation. When does this work? When the ratio of frequencies is smaller than the ratio of temperatures, which immediately tells us that the efficiency of this amplifier is limited by this relation, which we call the auto efficiency, and is smaller than common. And when do we get equality? When the gain is zero. So, <coughs> what Scoville showed us that three level amplifier is, you could say, the most simple example of a Carnot engine or a heat engine. What it does, it takes heat, it's two baths, and generates a radiation or work, which we would think as work. So, let, let's go on. So if we have this uh, device, what can we do? We can invert it. So instead of working in this direction, we just put radiation in, pump from this level up to this level, then spontaneously we close the cycle like that. And what it means is that we're taking heat out of our cold bath and dumping it into the hot bath. This is a refrigerator. So if 
you look at that, you could call this optical pumping on one hand, or you could call it laser cooling. And this, if you read this paper from 1959, this is exactly what uh, Scoville, which understood thermodynamics, if I have an engine, I can reverse it and make a refrigerator. You could do laser cooling. There's even an experiment in microwaves that was done at that period. And in a way we could use today exactly these relations here. What's interesting is that this was completely ignored by these two papers, which we usually assume for laser cooling, the paper of Wineland and the paper of uh, Hench from 1975, because these papers are not thermodynamic. They could simply look at the mechanism of uh, Doppler cooling. This is a thermodynamic uh, relation, which is much more general. So it's interesting to see, although these papers were published in good journals and people who were in physics, you should listen to other people. This is my, <laughs> sometimes you could learn some. So going from here, you can say there's kind of a gap. And this is uh, going to be kind of the motto of uh, what I'm going to talk about. And where do we go from here? So we want to put dynamics into thermodynamics. We're just not interested in static uh, issues or limits. We want to know, OK, how much power can we get out of a device? So this is usually the typical dilemma. You can have this car uh, sitting out of your drive yard or this car. And the question is, what do you uh, prefer? What do you like better? And the real uh, question is, what is the price that we pay for high power? And the price, of, so this is the efficiency power dilemma. And there's a lot of work on that, but I'll summarize it. This is, if I think about this engine, its efficiency is as close as possible to the Carnot efficiency, which would be the reversible limit. And if I want to get high power and high excitement, I go to the dissipative limit, I have entropy production, and this uh, efficiency at maximum power is not completely universal, but you'll see it appears in many times as a high temperature limit. So this uh, expression, which I put here, cools on album, was first uh, derived by Novikov, which studied uh, power stations in the Soviet Union, nuclear power stations, he came up to this relation. And you can say that this is, would be the efficiency at maximum power, and this is always smaller than the Carnot efficiency. Now, this, uh, you can say how much, what's the price between paid between efficiency and power? That's a great deal of, of this field of quantum thermodynamics, and there's a lot of work in, that's related with that, how much you have to pay. Can you reach a finite power at Carnot efficiency? These are questions of, you could say, that they're going around the literature in the last time. Now, how do we put dynamics into thermodynamics? The theory is embedded in theory of open quantum systems. And I won't go into describing the theory of open quantum systems. We have baths, we have, and we mostly use this type of equation which is a Markovian master equation to describe the dynamics. And so we have a Hamiltonian part, a unitary part, and a dissipative part. And this idea of open quantum systems developed in the, you can say, the mathematical physics in about the 70s. Here I put Lindblad as one of the founders of what's called the Lindblad equation, but you really should call it the LGKS equation for Lindblad, Uwini, Kusakowski, and Sudarshan, which derived this form that is, you could say, is common knowledge. This is what we're going to use for a system. So what does this do for us? This allows us to describe a thermodynamic scenario. I have a system coupled to a bath, and I have a heat current that goes from, you could say, the bath to the system. And you could ask, is this uh, theory consistent with uh, thermodynamics? This is what we should have. So here's, uh, uh, I put here 
Robert Talitsky, which is here, which derived this uh, relation. There's other work at the time. And <coughs> what we could do is this equation of uh, Lindblad. Let's write it in the Heisenberg form, Heisenberg equations of motion the following. So this would be the change in time of this operator, unitary part, commutator with a Hamiltonian, the dissipative part, and the explicit time dependence. And <coughs> if we choose for this operator the Hamiltonian itself, we get a time derivative of the first law of thermodynamics. So we get the time derivative of the change in energy has two parts. The explicit time dependence of the Hamiltonian, which we interpret as power, and the dissipative part of the Hamiltonian, which we interpret as heat curve. Now, uh, you could say there's more than 30 years since uh, this equation. This is still debated, this uh, basic equation. And <coughs> I'll reach that <coughs> so you could say, this not that this equation is not correct, but you could say, what are the assumptions that lead to this uh, equations? And what happens if we have different uh, times? So you could say what's de debated is really what you would call heat and what you would call work in the quantum world is still an evolving uh, discussion. Now, what do we know about thermodynamics? That heat always has to flow from hot to cold. And if we write it as a, I have the Hamiltonian of my hot part and then my system and the cold part and the energy flow should go in this direction. I have interaction. So in a way, no matter what, heat should flow in this direction. And the question is, what does a theory of open quantum system tell us? It allows us to get master equations which have the structure. There is a tensor product. Once we assume that, we know already that there is a tensor product. The total density operator is tensor product between the three parts, which is part of this, uh, you could say, this Markovian uh, construction. And we know that this is the direction of heat. So this is just a warning. If you do the, just assemble the master equations in a kind of a local approach, what it means, you take this equation that's connected to this heat path, and this part that's connected to this heat path, and you just connect them by a small link, you can violate the second law of thermodynamics. So <clears throat> why, do, why did I bring that? Because this is kind of, thermodynamics is an independent theory. We do our approximations. We can always check them and see if we get something that obeys the laws of na nature or, la or not. So you could say this uh, point here that I'm raising here has the three papers that just came in the last uh, month that kind of tried to see what is the appropriate derivation of a correct master equation that heat will flow in the thermodynamic uh, correct direction. Okay, so now let's go to some quantum devices. And the first devices that I'm going to uh, talk about are continuous quantum engines, which we have this example of this three-level amplifier, or you can say it's analogous to this jet engine, which works continuously all the time. And <coughs> what I'm going to <coughs> uh, start is this idea which came from uh, Lil Zillard together with Einstein. And what they were worried about in the 30s in, in Berlin was that refrigerators had ammonia as a refrigerant, and there were accidents. Ammonia would leak out, and ammonia is terribly poisonous, and people would die. So uh, Ziller had I don't, dinner with Einstein. They were discussing that. And then they, this, they invented what's called an absorption refrigerator. It's a refrigerator that has no moving parts, and it's powered by heat. It's not powered by electricity. And they patented, and Einstein thought that Zillard needed the money, so he gave all the money, all the rights of the patent to Zillard, but Zillard didn't need the money, but never mind, nobody made money on this patent. <laughs> so we started to look at this, I could say almost by accident, in 2001, this paper was Jose Palau, and we can think about it like that. We want to basically have a refrigerator that has a source 
You can say this would be the source of power, depends where I want to send this air. So I'll go in this direction, and on the way I'll drive heat from the cold breath. So let's look at this device. And what it really is is autonomous. What's good about these refrigerators, and this is why it's important to go down to the miniaturization level, they work by themselves. You connect them to the leaves and they refrigerate. So that's why they're called autonomous refrigerators. And here are some uh, papers that are dealing with that. But in the quantum optics context, it's very easy to understand how uh, these refrigerators work. So what do I have? I have a power source here. I want to cool the cold bath, and I want to dump the entropy here at the hot bath. So how do you do that? Look at this interaction Hamiltonian. I take here an excitation I, uh, out of here. I kill an excitation here. I kill an excitation here. So I took an excitation from here and here. I combine them together and I generated an excitation. So you already see this works. It's a nonlinear uh, device. And in addition, we could put these, what I would call three filters. I have a, you could say, a filter of frequency that they put here on the hot bath, on the cold bath, and the energy bath. And it works better if you're in resonance condition. You don't have to do that, but it would work when, when you can say this uh, cold bath frequency is the difference between the hot bath and so. This would be in resonance, and this transition would be in resonance. So you can realize it in many ways. I would say what's important to, to look, when you look at that, this is a nonlinear device. And Juan Pablo Paz, which is here, is able to prove that you can't build a refrigerator from linear devices. If you only have linear devices, baths that are coupled in a linear way one to each other, there's no way you can build a refrigerator or you can build a uh, heat pump. And, uh, okay, if you look, the energy balance is just a sum of these terms is zero when we work at steady state, and the entropy production should be positive. And so this is the basic construction of a, you could say, a tricycle a absorption refrigerator. Now, we could do some, since it's nonlinear, it's difficult to solve. We can linearize it by putting a semi-classical, putting power instead of uh, heat that comes in this direction. So the time dependence, I use a C number here. Then I can diagonalize this. I can solve for this refrigerator. And the point is that once I did that, this is pure power. What is pure power? Power is energy flow without entropy. So you can say I took away from this expression the entropy generation that comes from the power source. Now, once you do that, you can solve it. You can reverse it. This is this paper that was mentioned in 1984. You can reverse it, and you can make this as a heat engine. So you go in this direction, and you get power out of here. Now, when you solve it, what you get is something that's almost universal. The power goes as this frequency times the coupling times the gain. If you uh, do some optimizations, here's what I wrote here. The power is the frequency times the gain. And if you optimize this and you optimize the frequencies of that, and this is an old result, but this has been done in a better way by Kao, which was also in this meeting, you again get this universal or almost universal efficiency at maximum power that this, you can say, tricycle device you achieve is this corson alburn relation. And then if you look at this uh, graph, which is kind of normalized to the Carnot efficiency in P divided by P max, this is kind of a universal curve, in this case of an engine, this would be the maximum efficiency point, and this would be the maximum power point. So all these engines, if you drive them with different parameters, you get this kind of universal behavior. Refrigerators, doesn't it? Okay, this is just an example 
we can drive the refrigerator by pure noise. So this source is just pure noise. So you can see this FT is delta correlated. And again, this is a point here. What does it mean that we drive by pure noise? Pure noise is a zero entropy power source. So sometimes you think about noise that has a lot of entropy, but the truth is you see I emitted from here so I can drive a refrigerator by pure noise and it will work in the same way as I did before. Here are just the equations of motion. We won't go into that. And if you go to the high temperature limit, basically you get the same, uh, the same equation that I showed you before, which leads to this result that if we look at the, this is the current from the cold bath of this refrigerator, which are powered in different ways. So this is a, a power-driven refrigerator, three-level Gaussian noise-driven, Poisson-driven refrigerator. They have this universal kind of feature. You always see the gain, the population difference. You see a quant of energy. And this is, you could say, in this case, this is where quantum mechanics appears. The energy of quant is what the unit that you cool. And you see a kinetic term. And they have this a nice uh, Lorentzian shape, which in a way you would expect. Okay, so what you do is that. If you have these refrigerators, you can ask, okay, what happens when I take a refrigerator and try to cool to the absolute zero? So I have my cold bath. I have to specify what it is because I have these kinetic terms that tells how well I couple to the cold bath. And what we want to do, we want to cool and lower the temperature of the cold bath and to see how does the cooling current scale with the cold bath temperature. And what we expect from the third law of thermodynamics, here is Walter Nernst, which is sitting here watching us, is that the cooling will vanish when the cold bath temperature goes to zero. But the question is, what is the correct exponent? What is, is it universal? Can we say something about that? And if we look at the cold bath current, and the limit of uh, cold temperature, we see again, we have this quantum of energy. We have this kinetic term, which tells us the coupling between our refrigerator and what we want to cool. And we have the gain. Now, if we want to optimize this, and we can optimize with respect to this frequency that we couple, we immediately see that this frequency has to be proportional to the cold bath temperature. So when we become colder, you can say a refrigerator has to work with slow, smaller and smaller frequency, which means it has to become slower. Already from this piece, you can see that. So this has to be proportional to T. And then the question, how does this kinetic Term, how does it scale with temperature? And that's model dependent, at least is what we can find out. And we can look at it in two ways. What's the rate of temperature change as a function of temperature of the cold bath? This gives us one exponent, and it has to be larger than one, otherwise we would cool in finite time to absolute zero. And we can ask what's the exponent and the entropy change that when the temperature goes to zero, we, another version of the third law that we know that the entropy change should go to zero. And these are results for, if we want to cool both gas, we get this exponent, also for Fermi gas, and for harmonic bath, we get this exponent to be uh, one. And again, you can see these results uh, for all. There are other ways to look at the same problem of the third law. There's work by Lorenzo Viola, which it was interested in that, and there's work by Jonathan Oppenheim, which used resource theory to get that. He gets a different exponent. So I would say this is still uh, a question, uh, what's the right exponent? Uh, to, or is it universal, or can you say something about it? At least you could say that all these things obey the third law of thermodynamics, which is important. Here's just a graphical illustration. Here's the current, how it goes to zero, and this is the temperature, how it goes to zero for harmonic, for phonons, both gas, Fermi gas. Okay, so, I mean, also in this meeting, in the 
last years that people build these refrigerators. You could say before it was kind of my, a game that we played with ourselves. We wrote Hamiltonians, equations, solved them, and then somebody comes out and builds this equation, this uh, device. So this is a realization of this tricycle, exactly what I showed you before. And it's done with three ions in a trap. This experiment is in Singapore. And <clears throat> what they do, they, there's, they have a work reservoir. They draw differently than I do. So the direction is like that, and they cool the cold bath. And this is what you see in the experiment, that the cold bath uh, cools down and reaches, uh, you can say, a steady state. So you could say, how small a refrigerator can be. Here you can see you can miniaturize it to three ions in, in a trap. Okay, so now we can look at it and we can ask, okay, what is really quantum in this uh, refrigerator in general? So I took this graph from a friend of mine, Jeff Gordon, who was in uh, the desert. And in, this time, in this case, he was in Singapore and worked on air conditioners. And it's the same graph as I showed you before. The COP is efficiency of the refrigerator. And here's the cooling current. And you can see this kind of graph that here's the maximum efficiency and here's the maximum power. And this is a model. I won't describe it here. That's strong coupling. And you can say it's a driven refrigerator. And Basically, although this graph is different, the COP is here, it's the same thing. You can see here's the maximum efficiency point, and here's the maximum power, and you get this loop that closes on itself. So if I would just show you these two graphs, if I would plot them in a nicer way, you would say, okay, what's the difference between this, is, which is a quantum device, which I solved that was quantum mechanics, and this graph of a air conditioning unit sitting in, in Singapore, they look the same. So now let's go to a different type of, of engines, and which are reciprocating engines. These are more familiar to us in a way, because most of us drive the cars from here to there. So this is an auto engine. This is one of the first ones. I think it sits in a museum someplace. So this is an auto engine. And this is, you, you could say this would be, I'll try to convince you, the more modern version or miniaturized uh, auto engine, which I wrote it as a quantum circuit. So, but I'm trying to convince you that there's, there's another example, you could say, of a quantum circuit. So, the basic ideas that are hiding behind this reciprocal engine are also uh, hiding behind here. So, let's look at it. Here's Otto himself and his engine that was designed 1876 for competition at the World Fair in Paris, uh, who will build the best internal combustion engine. What's interesting that he first calculated its efficiency and then built it. So he did first the theory and then uh, built the, the engine. So let's look at it again in a more uh, Okay, this is how our simplified way you can think about our car. Here's gas in the cylinder. I heat it up. Then I let it, the cylinder expand so I get work out of that. I cool it down. I pour cold water on it. I compress it when it's cold. I expand it when it's hot. So eventually I'm going to get more work out of this expansion than I get out of compression. So this is the principle of our car engine. And Let's see how we can translate it to quantum mechanics. So the working medium can be many things. The most simple one to analyze is this harmonic oscillator uh, working medium. And we can think about it like that. Here's a same point here. Here's a hot side. I heated it up, reached to a certain equilibrium of population. I expand it. So I went from high frequency to low frequency, so I got to work out of it. But if I did it adiabatically, you can see the population changed the same on these levels 
and on these levels. So you can say that what we would call thermodynamic adiabatic movement, the quantum adiabatic movement in this case is the same. And then I cool it, so I move population down, and I expand it, and I close the cycle. So if you look at that, you can say the power that I got out of it would be the change in frequency times the change in population. This would be the ideal power that I get out of this engine. And if you look, uh, here I just reversed it, put, made the refrigerator out of it. And what you get out of it for the efficiency, you get what's called the auto-efficiency, the same efficiency that we saw uh, before, 1 minus the ratio of, of frequencies. But now let's make it more interesting, more quantum mechanical. So let's look at it in phase space. So I start here, the same place. So I'm in equilibrium. And if you look at that, that's the energy kind of bowl. So this would be the harmonic position. This would be momentum. So you can say my state is in equilibration with this, in a certain temperature, with this bowl. So now what do I do? I expand in this direction. So I make my bowl flatter. But if I did it fast, I got the squeeze state. So I got the squeezed thermal state here. So this will have consequences. We'll see. So I did this move here. And now I cooled it. Again, got to equilibrium. So it's round, sitting beautifully in the bowl. And then I do this move fast. So again, got the squeeze state. And here I'm getting to thermal equilibrium. So this is more a realistic kind of picture of what happens to this engine in phase space. So what are uh, really the consequences, or how do we uh, think about it? We think about it as a series of propagations. We took my state, moved it from one uh, state to another. So I can think about it as a propagator that's the hot, which does this equilibration then from hot to cold, the adiabatic expansion, I change the frequency from omega h to omega c, the cold, and the cold back to the hot. And altogether, I can think about the cycle, the auto cycle, as concatenations of these four propagators, hot to cold, cold, cold to hot, hot, and this would give me the propagator of the cycle. And if you go into your car in the morning and you start it up, and you see what happens. So it curves a little bit, but then you reach a limit cycle. This is the point where we want to be. We, the limit cycle is an invariant of this propagate. Now, if you look at these four strokes of my engine in this abstract way, you immediately realize that they can't commute. So if I change here, let's say this was this, I would cancel my these, you could say this, these two strokes, and then it would get basically two So I got these propagators. I got non-commuting propagators. You could think, is this quantum mechanics? The answer is no. Because also in stochastic description, if you think about the classical master equation, the permutations, which are the unitary moves, and the thermalizations don't commute. So, Although you would like this to be, this doesn't mean that your car is a quantum option. It would work without that. Now, we can, for harmonic oscillators, as you expect, you can solve everything. This is a way like, to think about it. I can define a time-dependent Hamiltonian, because my frequency is changing in time. I can look at the Lagrangian, which is this. I can look at the position momentum correlation. This is closed as an algebra. And the, what you sh should think of in equilibrium, this L and C operators, their expectation values are zero. This is basically kinetic energy is equivalent, is the same as potential energy in equilibrium. And there's no position momentum correlation in equilibrium. So I can always think about the states, at least in this in my engine as a maximum entropy state or generalized Gibbs state with these three operators. And if you want to look at it, it becomes a squeeze thermal state. I can always describe 
and <coughs> at least for this harmonic auto cycle, the state of my system is a squeezed uh, state, so it means if I know the three operators, I know everything. I can reconstruct the state, I can get from depth the entropy, and I can continue from there. Now we can solve, in this case, the open uh, system. This is, would be just a thermalization of a harmonic oscillator, standard uh, equation, base detail balance. You can write the equations of motion. You can get the propagator. So what I'm using is this, these set of vectors as my basis to define my propagator. So this would lead to thermalization. And what you see here, that energy is not coupled to L and C, which would be the coherences. So when we thermalize, this is well known in thermalizing a master equation, you don't mix energy with coherence. Now, on the adiabats, you do mix uh, energy and coherence. You generate coherence. This is a squeezing that we saw in the picture before. You can write the equations of motion. I wrote it in a particular case which using this dimensionless uh, adiabatic parameter. And you can see that once, if I assume that this dimensionless adiabatic parameter is constant, during my stroke, I can solve these equations and I can explicitly get uh, my propagate. Now there are other ways to solve this, but what, what I want to show that you can get explicit uh, equations of motion that you can solve for the engine. So you can get everything here. And this is just uh, to show how this engine looks like. This is entropy. The energy entropy, or you could say the projection on the diagonal parts, of, and as a function of the frequency, and this would be the cold isotherm, the hot isotherm, and my cycle goes like that. I start from this point. I try to equilibrate, and if I want to get finite power, I never completely complete my equilibration. I stop before. I move here to this point B. This is my diabetic move. You see I'm moving upwards because I'm generating coherence. I move down here and I close the cycle. This is in the space of this vector space of these three operators. You can see this is a cold side. These are the diabetic moves. Here I'm heating up and I'm closing the diabetic Now, the efficiency, this diabetic efficiency is what's called the auto-efficiency, always smaller than Carnot. And what we see that we have here, uh, quantum friction. And the friction comes because I can't stay at quantum mechanically at the abet. I mean, if I'm moving fast, I have to put power to generate coherence. And if I can cancel this coherence, I can gain, gain that. But, so I can cancel it either by going very slowly or there are methods that are called shortcuts to elasticity, which I can cancel uh, the coherence that generate. So you can say this quantum friction is inability to stay in the energy shell. There's an energy cost to that, and my efficiency or will go down. And again, at high temperature, the, we get the same result at the efficiency at maximum power. We gain this same expression that I showed you before. So there is a universality about that. Okay, can this be realized? So this is a realization as a uh, refrigerator. I'm sure people have this in their labs. It's called a diabetic demagnetization refrigerator. In this case, the working fluid <coughs> is magnetic salt, which basically works on high spin states of the salt pill whatever it is, and it's an auto cycle. This pill shuttles up and down and completes the same cycle that I showed you before. So this is a realization. This I took from a web page of NASA, so this sits in a satellite someplace cooling uh, a detect. What's more interesting is this realization that people who did that are in the audience, Uli and uh, where it's Ferdinand here. Here it is. So this is a realization.
utilization of an autocycle, and in this case it's an ion sitting in this structure of, you can say, ion trap that has this unusual shape, that the reason is that the frequency here is different than the frequency here. So by shuttling the ion back and forth in this direction, you can realize the autocycle, and this is, you can see, you can see this is from uh, the experiment. It, it draw it opposite the direction that I draw my uh, engine before. So what we see here that you could realize an auto engine with one ion in a trap. So the question of miniaturization, we can miniaturize to now. <coughs> if we can apply what's needed, hot bath, cold bath, a working medium, we can miniaturize. So what is quantum? So here I brought, this is a car that was made in Britain. You can say it's called quantum. So you can call this a quantum car. Toyota also made a quantum. I call it a particle in a box, but it's also a quantum car. But in a way, I showed you an auto engine. Is it some, is it really quantum? So you would say it's not very convincing. You can say I could miniaturize, I can make a miniature engine, but is it really quantum? What is really a quantum uh, heat engine? So this is what I want to show. When can we be sure that the device that we made is really quantum? What are the criteria that we need to that? And this is work that was done with Ramos Dean, which is here. And the question is, can we somehow find an equivalence between different types of engines, you can say a continuous engine, a jet engine, a two-stroke engine on the scooter, or a four-stroke auto engine. Is there <coughs> some conditions that we can put, embed this in the same kind of description? And what we'll sh I'll show you in a minute that in this limit, when <coughs> all the action becomes the scale of h-bar, these engines become equivalent. So, in this case, the working fluid is just a qubit, so we can think here, I'm heating my qubit, I'm having work, I'm changing the frequency, I'm cooling it, again work, increasing the frequency, so this would be a four-stroke engine. A two-stroke engine would be, here I have a qubit here and a qubit here, I equilibrate this qubit with a hot bath, this with a cold bath, and then I get my power out by a swap. I just swap between them and I can get power. And a continuous engine we already saw, we have a simple example of a three-level amplifier that we can get work out of there. So these are the types of the engine we will discuss. And to make them put them on common ground, we use a four-level structure. So we can say, and this is what's called multi-level embedding, we make all these engines be equivalent first by construction, so then we can compare uh, them one to each other. And you can see, for example, this four-stroke auto engine, here I equilibrate these two levels, then I do a swap here, I equilibrate these two levels, then I do a swap again, and you can think this is same way, show I have propagators that define my cycle. The two stroke, I do this simultaneously and then I do a swap. I can describe it like that. Or continuously, everything is happening at the same time. So these are the engines that we uh, will try to compare, at least in this uh, construction. And what can we say? We can look at this in the following way. We have this propagator. I can always write it to, as a power of some Louisvillian times t, or some, something that happens here. And for a as we saw, the four-stroke cycle propagator, we can write it as I said. There's hot to cold, hot, cold to hot, cold. This is the cycle propagator. Now, if I use this expression, I can write it to the power like that. I can write it as this product of four propagators. And now, there's a trick that I'm sure most people know, that if you have small action, that I can expand this exponent. So this, you can say the norm of L times T is, you 
could say that not smaller than h bar, that's for sure would work. So then I can make this product into a sum. And to make it a little better, you take half this exponent here, move it half here, which is a common trick which people who do time propagation of the time dependent Schrodinger equation, what's called the split operator method, they do. So sometimes it's called the Trotter formula, there are other names to it, but this is correct up to order three. So if you write it in this way, you can always write it in the sum. So you can say this is a formal mathematical exercise, but what does it mean? That in this limit, that my action is small, that you can say the cycle of a continuous engine and a cycle, in this case, of a four-stroke engine, is basically the same, up to a certain order which goes to the action p. So if we look at small action, so this is the time, so we can see this each time here is a stroke, we can see that all these engines could become the same at uh, this point. I think this, in this case, we're looking at the work that comes out. So in the middle, they're not the same, in the middle of the stroke, but they coalesce at the end of the stroke. So this is what we get. When we have large action, all these engines are very different from each other. So what we first got here is the equivalence at small action limit. You can say that all engines are the same. The same as I uh, defined it. They give the same work, they have the same heat, and uh, they have the same performance. Now, this has an additional uh, consequence. Here we can look at this action scale. When it, I'm enlarging this piece here, you can see all these engines have uh, the same behavior, and the deviation, in this case, it's a power, not the work. The power, the deviation goes uh, scales as, as uh, squared. So now we have a limit, which we know is quantum, because our scale is, in this case, h bar. So the question is, OK, now we know that this limit is quantum. How can we be sure? Is there a way that I can tell the experimentalist, listen, this engine is quantum. If you do that, you'll find out. So before I go that, what is the criterion? If we think about the quantum computer, it's the same way. We know that if I look at the quantum computer while it works, it won't work. If I measure it in the middle, if I open the hood from my car. So you can think about it in the same way. Now, nowadays, nobody opens the hood of the car. But you can say, if you open the hood, the car will stop to work. So this is, would be the uh, criteria that we kind of think, OK, when is an engine or a device really quantum? So this is what's called here the quantum signature. If we are in this region of power, and we compare it to a stochastic engine, if we find that our power is in this region, we know we're quantum. So what do we compare to? We compare to a stochastic engine. What is a stochastic engine? It has no coherence at all. It only works on populations. So you can see this is kind of the limit. This is the limit of a deface two-stroke engine, a four-stroke engine, and if we are up here, there's no way we can do that uh, without coherence. We can say it in another way that the work extracting mechanism is based on coherence. So if we kill the coherence, the engine should stop to work. So as I said, if we open the hood, our engine will stop. So one way to do it is to increase the time of thermalization. So if we, this is the engine as a function of if we increase the time of thermalization, we basically deface the coherence, and the engine will stop to work in this uh, case. So another way is just to add dephasing and to see them. So we have a criterion. We know that when engines work in this quantum limit, where each stroke is, does very, you could say, very small action, or angle in some kind of vector space, then we have a quantum device. And again, the question, can this be realized? Does somebody can really measure this in the lab? And this is recent results that come from uh, the uh, 
lab in Oxford, and uh, Ian Wormsley and was supposed to come this week, he couldn't come. And it's realized in, uh, in this case, an Envy Center in Diamond. So, again, this is, uh, in this case, what could be realized is a two-stroke engine and a continuous engine, and the phasing could be added to it. And you can see that in this limit, they all coalesce. You can see the quantum signature, first of all, the engine works uh, here you can see the quantum signature is at least for sigma, so it's really, really deep in the quantum uh, regime. And then when dephasing is, is added, the en engine stops uh, to work. What's the piston here? They have a piston. Where, where does the... Uh, what is the piston? Where does the energy go to? Yeah. So you have... You pump it up. It's, it's an atom, it's in a way you pump it. Optically. Yeah. A microwave. It's microwave. You have microwave and, microwave and two optics. Okay, this is, uh, you could go to, to strong coupling, but I think uh, the idea about going to strong coupling that you have to add to your engine a heat exchanger to basically mediate your baths with engines that work at strong coupling. Uh, I won't go too much into it, so I think it's time to kind of summarize what I hope you got out of that. So, what did I try to say? What is a quantum and a quantum heat engine? And I would say this is a good practical definition. If you look at it, it doesn't work. This is a definition. So, this is how I treat my car. Also, I never look at it. I go into it and drive it. I think most of us do the same thing. But, uh, so we don't know if it's quantum or not. And so you can say, okay, what are really other signatures? So we saw that at low temperature, we change, the unit of energy changes from kT to h bar omega. So we see quantization of the unit of energy. And again, this is not surprising if people have quantized heat transport and so on, so you, you get this, uh, this limit. Okay, this is a more interesting uh, point here. As I, as I said, there is, in the diabetic strokes of an engine, there is a way to overcome friction. And these are called shortcuts to adiabaticity. There is, I would say, a nice industry that deals how to do that. But you could think, okay, well, how does it work? So as I said, if I move my adiabatic motion, to front, I generate coherence. But if I generate coherence, I can cash on it. So if I'm clever enough with my protocol, I can generate coherence, and I can use this coherence to cancel it. So eventually, shortcuts to adiabaticity mean that I start on the energy shell and I end on the energy shell, so there's no wasted work that goes to friction. The price you pay is a price in a protocol that you have to do a special type of protocol. So you can say that these frictionless uh, solutions are in a way quant, because they use coherence, but they use this coherence within, you can say, only the diabetic stroke. A fully quantum engine uses coherence on the whole cycle. You could say that would be the difference uh, between the shortcuts and if I use it on the whole cycle. And this is, would be to the sudden limit where there's small action, so the engine, all engines become equivalent, and we can find this uh, quantum signature. Okay, what are, you could say, uh, the challenges in summary, what I want to see. I didn't go all through this, but there's a lot of work how to, to look at the all the laws of thermodynamics was in the context of quantum mechanics. This is an important feature that this tensor product between the system and that, which is always obeyed in Markovian type master equations that I used. Strong coupling, this is not true anymore. We have to rethink our things. And as I said, there is a lot of discussion about alternative definitions of heat and work. And the reason is, 
heat is easy because heat goes away to infinity. But work, you can say, is energy without entropy. That's why you can say instantaneously, definition of work is not so straightforward. So there's ways to define work. You can define work on a whole cycle, but instantaneously, these are not. So it's in a way better to think about energy currents. You can see there's all kinds of ideas how to use the second law in the more restrictive ways. And finally, the third law to get this uh, exponent. And one thing that I learned at this uh, meeting that I would say came out in the last, you could say, two years, that is emerging many experiments that will keep us honest. Many experiments on heat devices, refrigerators that are being constructed, and papers are appearing, I would say every week there is some realization of a heat engine, so that puts us in a completely new era of these devices. Now, this point here, which is called quantum supremacy, is this car that I showed you before, this, let's say, Toyota, which says quantum, is it better? This would be quantum supremacy. You can say until now there are indications that you can get that, but I would say nothing is overwhelming. It's not the same case as we can see in quantum computing that we know it, we're exponentially bad. We're bad. We can find instances that we can get more power, but I would say at this point this is something that has to be explored. I'm sure if I would come here in a year or so, this challenge will be uh, met people will find ideas how to really construct a quantum engine that has more power than it's, uh, you could say, classical analog. <coughs> so this is where we're going to conclude. So thank you very much. if you know how to cash on it. But, if, but let's put it like that. To generate coherence, it costs me power or work. Yes. So if I waste it, dissipate it, that's a pure loss. That's friction. But if I know how to use it, so I would say one example. If you, if you give me a squeeze cat, I could go back to this harmonic oscillator case. I could pre-squeeze my initial states. I wouldn't start with an initial state that's on the energy shell. I'll already have it squeezed. And I can cash on that, and I would get more power out of my engine. So you could say this coherence is a resource if I know how to use it. I, I'm not sure that squeezing the, the coherence are synonymous. I mean, in this, in this case, a they are. Squeeze, well, a thermal squeeze state is a classical state. Unless it is a very low temperature, but, but it, can it still be, has all these features. Right? It can be low, as low as you want. No, the you can low. say the harmonic also the, the things that are there. Yeah, but I, I could change my argument. I could use a spin system and you would see the same. If I could use that as a resource. If I could use the coherence, like it's a resource. No, I mean, squeezing is a resource. I no, but I, but I would say if, I, if you would... Find another way to give me coherence, like Scully in a way taught us that. Yeah. I know how to cash on that in my engine. It's not arbitrary if I know how to cash on it. Yeah, but that doesn't prove that uh, they are necessarily better than platinum. Or does it? Okay, you can say shortcuts. Give me more power. In principle, that's already better. Yeah. Because, and then, and sh to, if I do a shortcut, I 
generate coherence, I cache on it, and I can make my adiabatic move faster. So that's already better. So you can say already using coherence in a shortcut that they can do a better en engine than otherwise. Okay. Question okay. Um, so would you get qualitatively different results by also accounting for memory effects in open quantum systems? And so I guess the question is whether memory effects can be viewed as, as just a kind of different sort of coherence or if, if they could lead to something new, I guess. Okay, so and what, what I describe as Markovian, so I don't have memory in a, in a sense, not that if, if I keep coherent through the cycle, it's like memory. Because I have, I'm, you could say my cycle is not only described by energy at its uh, points, I have additional variables that describe the whole cycle. So they, you could think about them as memory variables. So if I can do that, my engine is better. Now, I, I, what, what, what I think your question is good because I don't think we exploited this enough. This idea of adding, you can say, I can like fill a qubit and cache and use it, use a, a measurement, and, and do it later. What, <clears throat> so, I didn't describe that, but there, what you can do, for example, in one of in these engines, you can measure and you can uh, apply feedback. And then you get more advanced version. And the way we have to do that, 